Hi, this is Chris, the Guitar Amp Tech from Sydney, Australia. Today we'll be continuing our short series looking into the main contributors to Tube Amp SAG. The series is pretty much in a logical order. If you haven't seen the previous chapters, go back. And if you're ready to get started, grab a coffee, pull up a chair, and let's get stuck in. <laughs> I'm hoping that this chapter will be relatively brief, but because it's so important, it's deserving of its own specific description. I could have called this chapter a short description of capacitor shorts, but I digress as usual. Let's continue our look at the role of filter capacitors, how they interact with the rectifier, and together how they influence tube amp sag. Let's start with a very important point that you may not have already thought about. Okay, now here's a um, 5E3 uh, Tweed Deluxe. I like this, simple, great sounding. But here's what we want to look at. We want to look at this first filter that the rectifier is seeing. This high voltage here is after rectification, B plus this is called here that goes across this capacitor. Now with a good healthy capacitor, this to here looks like an open circuit to DC. Remember our demonstration of how to make a capacitor, two conductive plates, nothing can pass between them except alternating current. DC blocked, and that's what we want. We don't want to see a short circuit from here to there of our DC. Let's have another look at an alternating current and remind ourselves of a couple of things. So you'll see that an alternating current starts here at zero volts, works its way up to maximum, back to zero, down to minimum, back up to maximum, via zero, down to another zero, blah, blah. That's alternating current. That's not going to help us much. The average value of all of this is zero. So it's gone through a rectifier. Here comes some simple math. I will use Australia's 50 hertz because we need the math to be a little bit simpler. And um, 50 hertz is 50 cycles per second. You know this, cycles per second. That means one cycle is 1 50th of a second, which is 0.02 of a second, which is 20 milliseconds. So our distance between here and here is 20 milliseconds. So the distance between this peak and this peak is 10 milliseconds. So the difference between, hang on, you go over there. Oh, okay, down here then. No, you don't want to go anywhere. All right. So the distance between here and here is 5 milliseconds. Time to introduce our filter capacitor. This capacitor has been asleep for a few hours or weeks and it is fully discharged. That means it has zero volts on one plate and zero volts on the other plate. This one is always going to stay at zero. But this little fella is going to do its best to go from a sleepy zero to a what the... 400 volts within 5 milliseconds. Now here comes an important point. So wake up in the back of the room. We can also describe a change in DC as being alternating current. You remember that the voltage in alternating current starts at zero, like our capacitor, goes all the way to maximum, like our capacitor, and then back down again. This is where our capacitor is getting a little bit anxious. And you may remember when we said that a capacitor looks like a closed switch to alternating current. That means for a very short time we will have a closed switch or a short circuit across our high voltage and ground. That's got to hurt, right? That's a lot of current but for a very short period of time. And the larger the capacitance, 
the more current it will take to fully charge until it no longer looks like a short to our rectifier or our power transformer. A digital display is great for most purposes when it comes to accuracy, but when you need to see the rate of change, nothing quite beats an analog meter. In my current limiter, I have a switch positioned to enable the full mains to pass through, but it also goes through this cute looking little analog current meter. It has a full scale deflection of one amp. Now there's not many amps that'll draw one amp at idle with no signal, not even a 100 watt twin reverb. Twin reverb. That's what I said, twin reverb. Watch what happens when I turn on my oh, 18 watt Marshall amp. And flicking from standby to play mode. That peak of current that you saw then, instantaneous as it was, is our inrush current. Hard to read the value, but I'd be thinking that that was around about 0.7 of an amp, give or take, and the idle looks like around about 0.3. So I purposely picked a fairly low powered amp, 18 watt, and uh, or else if I use a 40 watt amp, that uh, one amp scale just goes bang, it's the full scale. At least this way we got to see it um, in its actual reading. So it was like double, triple the steady state current. So it's, it is substantial. So that's our takeaway for this little demonstration. A capacitor will look like a short circuit for an instant of time and draw a lot of current. And a big capacitor will draw more inrush current than a small capacitor. So now let's add to this thought. Did you know that a tube rectifier is more sensitive to this inrush current than a solid state rectifier? So how do we determine what is a safe value of capacitance for our rectifier tubes? Yes, Mr. Smartass, thank you. You are quite correct. We look at our tube data sheet. Let's start with the 5Y3. So frustratingly, uh, not all data sheets display the same information. So I want to draw your attention to, well, this thing first. Um, you'll quite often see um, this comment here where it says capacitor input filter. And you'll see some other, uh, probably on the other page, which I didn't copy out, it'll say choke input filter. So depending on whether you use, uh, whether, whether the first thing it sees is a, is a capacitor or a choke, we will have different conditions. I'm concentrating on a capacitor. So you'll see here, it says the filter input capacitor is 10 microfarad. Um, in other uh, data sheets, it'll show it as 20 microfarad. Yeah, I know. What, what, what can you do? So we know it's going to be the 10 or 20, somewhere between 10 and 20. So let's have a look and see, did Leo Fender follow the rule book? And we can see the rectifier and the first capacitor is indeed 16 microfarad. So good, Leo did follow that rule book. Okay, here is the um, data sheet for the Telefunken GZ34. And uh, once again, you see this um, spec here for a choke input or a capacitor input. We're gonna stay focused on the capacitors and uh, I'm not sure if you can see that, but uh, the maximum first filter cap for a GZ34 is 60 microfarad. Let's remember that. As we see if Leo Fender kept to the rule book. Here is the uh, power stage schematic for a Blackface Pro Reverb. And at first glance, you may be thinking, oh my God, he's got 270 microfarads, which is 140 microfarads, you'd be thinking, which would blow that GZ34 into eternity. Luckily, no. So if you don't already know this, add this to your depth of knowledge that capacitors in series 
are the same as resistors in parallel. In other words, we would halve these. So that's equivalent to 35 microfarad. But we add the voltages, and therein is the benefit. So this is equivalent to one capacitor of 35 microfarad at 700 volts. So you may be wondering what these two resistors are about. Um, various names, I call them totem resistors because they're stacked on top of each other. And resistors are going to basically define the voltage across each capacitor. So one capacitor doesn't accidentally drift over its voltage rating. So this is going to nail it pretty much exactly at zero maximum and half because they're both 220K. So that's the situation with um, a GZ34. Now, solid state rectifiers though are nowhere near as sensitive to inrush current. Okay, let's have a look at the data sheet for a 1N4007. And um, just to a quick comparison to a 5AR4 GZ34. So this is an important value. One amp of forward current per diode. So looking at my 5AR data sheet, peak current 825. So it's already higher than the most efficient of the tube rectifiers. Then let's have a look at the forward voltage drop. That's here. So that's telling us when at full current, it's only going to drop 1.1 volts. The um, uh, 5AR4 will be dropping 17 volts. That is what we call SAG, one element of SAG at least, the voltage drop of a, a tube rectifier. Solid state rectifiers are nowhere near as sensitive to inrush current, but we still need to be mindful of exceeding the fuse limits, which are there also to protect the power transformer. Because remember, pretty sizable short circuit. Well, that was a pretty decent overview of the importance of capacitors and rectifiers. Let's take a break and meet up again next week as we compare tube and solid state rectifiers and ask, are their capacitor limits the same? And do all rectifiers sag the same? And if not, how do they vary? If you got something out of this video, could you please hit the like button and subscribe? If you have any questions or comments, put them down here. I do go through every comment, so I will get around to answering every question or comment. This video series took a fair bit of time to put together, and I'm hoping you got some value out of it. And by subscribing, it shows to YouTube that I have been of service to you. I look forward to seeing you next week in the next chapter of tube amp sag.